Welcome to Uriah Heep, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and this season we are revisiting songs that we visited once with guests, and I am now doing them solo because there may be some things that I missed along the way or that, you know, in the way of conversation just forgot to bring up. So I thought I'd just do this to kind of ramp up to the release of the new album, Chaos and Colors, coming out January 27th worldwide. I cannot wait. My copy is on order. And I wanted to let you guys know, too, that I am going to be doing the reviews based off of the deluxe copy. And that is already available on Amazon. It's going to be an interesting one, I think. Um, I don't know fully what's going to be on it. It is a digipack. And typically within a digipack, there is some kind of video footage. The last couple albums, they've done behind the scenes documentaries on the making of the albums. I don't know officially if there is going to be one, but the fact that it's a digipack as opposed to just a CD leads me to believe that there may be something. Um, It might not be anything more than just like the video or whatever. I don't know. We'll have to see because nothing is ever listed on Amazon as far as bonus footage goes, um, but it is listed as a deluxe version digipack. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, There is 11 tracks on the, oh, I'm sorry, there is 12 tracks on this one, two versions of Save Me Tonight, which is the first song on the album and the one single that they have released so far, and then uh, a bunch of other tracks. But that, I believe, the Save Me Tonight is part of why it's the deluxe, or if not all of why it's deluxe, because it has that as a bonus track. Uh, There are a couple of different versions floating around there. So if you're looking at the one with 12 tracks, that's the one that I'm going to be reviewing on the show. I did verify with the manufacturer that is the most comprehensive. So that is what I'm going with. That kind of follows the line of all the deluxe editions that I have reviewed to make sure that I get all the songs over the you know, year and a half I was doing the show. So that being said, there is one more bit of house cleaning that I did not get to in the last episode. I knew there was something I was forgetting. I want to thank all the patrons who have been so generous with their donations throughout the course of this show. Um, shortly after I stopped producing episodes, I kind of cut it off because it isn't right for me to charge people when I'm not providing them something to earn that. I'm not giving a fair trade for their value. So uh, every month I go in and I'm like, nope, freeze the Patreon account. Nope, freeze the Patreon account. Uh, And I have been doing that indefinitely. Um, I'm going to close it off at some point here. I just haven't figured out the best way to to do it. But, uh, you know, I don't know what content there's going to be after we do the album. I am hoping to get in a round of interviews with the band. I've already reached out on that. It's looking very good. It's just going to depend on the timing of their tour and my schedule when we can get together to do that. Um, but other than that, you know, that's, that's going to be the bulk of it. So again, it's like, we're going to have this short burst and then we're like waiting for a new album to come out or something to happen. So, um, I, I just don't feel right doing that. So I want to thank you guys. I I don't uh, want to belittle your donations or anything in any way by not accepting them. They're certainly very much appreciated, and that does put the cost back on me, but that's fine. Um, You guys have helped me pay off the show for the next couple of years to keep it on the internet, which is great because regardless of whether I'm producing shows or not, I have to pay a yearly fee. So uh, this helps me do that for the next couple of years. So thank you very much. Um, I just believe in fair trade for, for value. And if I can't give it, I shouldn't take it. So there's that. Now, Let's dig into this marathon, epic, famous song, The Magician's Birthday. The first time I saw Uriah Heat play here in Las Vegas, I was so excited that they did this. I was not expecting it. Specifically, did not look at any set list. I wanted everything to be a surprise. And when they started it up, I thought, oh, cool, they're going to do a little bit of The Magician's Birthday, having no idea that they would do like the whole damn song. And it was absolutely amazing to watch. 
um, great to experience. Hopefully, uh, some of you guys have been able to do that or will be able to do that as they're continuing to tour. Um, so we're in January right now as this airs middle of January. Uh, it's the end of November for me. It's a very cold night here in Las Vegas. So I have my hot cup of chai tea to help me get through the episode. And let's dig in. I'm going to let this play a little bit longer because, you know, this is the intro to the show as well. And I always interrupt it after the lyrics start. Uh, we all know I love the intro, so I'm just going to let it play through a little bit longer than I, I normally would. One thing I have always loved about this album, and I think it really stands out on this song because there's a lot going on sonically, is just how well it's mixed. I mean, the mix is fantastic for me. Uh, And again, I'm listening off the deluxe version, so it might, you know, this might be because of the remaster that I'm hearing some things that I might not realize I wasn't hearing when I had the LP. And, uh, but I mean, the, the bass drum is punchy. It's a little bit quiet. I could use it a little more, uh, you know, thumping on my chest, but overall it sounds good because it cuts through. You can hear it. It's not buried with uh, the bass. It's actually a very good balance of bass guitar and drums. And also the snare, you know, the snare is not so loud that it cracks your ear, but it's defined. You can really hear every single time he hits it. And, uh, and I didn't mention the lineup on this one, uh, which I'll be, we should be doing for every song this season because we're really jumping around the albums. Uh, lead vocals, we have David Byron on guitar, Mick Box. Bass, we have Gary Thane. Drums, Lee Kerslake. And keys, we have Ken Hensley, of course. Uh, Also, uh, some other instruments we will hear later uh, that Ken fills in with. Um, But yeah, it's uh, it's really, really well mixed. David's voice comes through beautifully. And you hear... um, you know, the guitars are, are still playing that opening riff throughout the verse. You hear the bass coming through. Like, everything sounds really, really good. And I, I really have to say, this is a fantastic mix, which, because there's so much going on, like, you could listen to the song three or four times in a row and pick out different stuff every time. You know, this is another fantastic song for Gary Thane. It, it just his talent is so limitless. You know, I, I love where he goes. He, he's he's just so exploratory as a bass player, but it, like all the notes work and they make sense and you don't feel like he's experimenting, but he's just so all over the fretboard. It adds such another dimension to the music. And, you know, all the bass players of Uriah Heap have done that. And uh, that's one thing that is really signature to their sound. Uh, you know, when I listen to Davey play now, it's very much the same thing. And uh, it's just a really incredible sound for a band because not a lot of bands were really exploring that. I, I, I'm sure there's some that we could name, but overall, you know, bass players were, you know, they, they were a little bit colorful, but not to the point of the style of Uriah Heap, very rarely. Um, another thing, though, I've always kind of thought that this song really kind of should have been done in sections, you know. Um, If you think about a song like In the Court of the Crimson King, where there's, you know, there's the the main song and then there's the, uh, you know, you know, the subsections of the song that are actually listed as cuts within the main track. I kind of feel like you could do that. You could do the Orchid Orchestra performance. You could do the Happy Birthday song, um, you know, because they're really changes. They're completely different segments. And, um, 
they didn't do that though. It's all done under the magician's birthday, which is fine. But it's just like there's so much stuff within it that I almost feel like it needs to to look as epic as it sounds. I love this part because it's such a great transition from the the main part of the song into this special section that we're only going to get this one time. Uh, it, it's just such a beautiful transition, which I've said so many times that Heap are just masters of transition. But I love mixed tone. It's it's distorted, but it's also kind of light. It's not really heavy. Uh, of course, he's playing, you know, the more melodic notes in the mid mid register. But uh, even even when he was playing the opening riff, like it's got a heavy sound to it, but it's not really bottom endy. Uh, it's just kind of light on the tone a little bit, which I like. I like that because it lets the bass shine through a little bit more, too. And um, also the lower notes on the keyboard coming through. I also like the inclusion of the kazoo because it's so fascinating to me that a, a rock band you know, who's writing some reasonably heavy stuff coming off of songs like, you know, Easy Living, Salisbury, uh, Look at Yourself, would even think about including a kazoo in a song. You know, I'm still baffled by that because I think it's such a bold decision. It sounds like if you if you sat around the table, you know, well, let's talk about this song. What do we need to change? Are, are we all happy with it? And somebody says, I think we need to add a kazoo. I, I don't know how many people would have looked around and said, yeah, we need a kazoo. I, I think it's something that is a really bold choice. And the only way you would know if it works or not is if you actually just put it in the song and listen back. And I think it absolutely does. It's fantastic. And it's not, you know, it doesn't sound like a child's instrument in this either. It's very well played. It's It's got a lot of um, melody and motion to it. So it's really much more of a serious instrument for being what it is, a, a brilliant use of it. This is such a brilliant build here. I mean, it, it just, in a way, it just kind of seems like it's repeating, but it's actually got a little bit of a build up to it, which is, it's subtle, but you can feel it if you're really paying attention. Um, but those backing vocals are particularly interesting because I'm pretty sure that we will hear this vocal effect again when we get to the title track of the album, Return to Fantasy. Um, it's, it's done a little bit differently, but I'm pretty sure it's the same effect. It's almost kind of muted or filtered, but I, I, but I love the sound of it. it. It's really cool. And I think it adds a nice contrast and something a little bit different. You know, we've got good a, a lot of good backups in this song. So to have a, something with a little bit different of a tonality to it um, just keeps things fresh, too. It's It's a nice addition. Good idea, whoever thought of that. I love that sound. It, it doesn't sound like a piano. It sounds more like chimes, but it doesn't sound exactly like chimes either. It could be something on the Moog. But either way, that just that decrescendo, that run of notes, it's, it's fantastic. But what I like more is the wash that it goes into, like a wash of reverb that just sounds very disconnected from the song, kind of a, a, a you know, a, a darkness is coming kind of feel. And I like that because of where the song's about to change. So that's a really interesting part that was put in there. Um, might be one of my favorite parts in the song. Actually, it is one of my favorite parts in the song. Then at the dead of midnight as we 
Watch the dancing firelight The air grew cool Seemed to dull the flame The fire died The music faded Filled with fear of death we waited For now we knew some evil was to blame See, and here's where that sort of, you know, precursory darkness was headed, because now we're going to go into a completely different part of the song. The mood's going to change completely. It's going to be chaos. And this is another section where I feel like this could have been, you know, like a, another subsection with a different title within the song. But uh, it's it's really cool. We're going to head into some really amazing territory. Now, you guys may remember the one rule I have on this show which is we do not interrupt a mic box solo. So when we get there, it's it's going to run for a while because it's it's quite a lengthy piece. But you know what? Uh, just sit back and enjoy every note because it is just damn awesome. You know, those single piano chords that were playing during that chaotic part and then during this part where things are a little more gathered together. Uh, boy, that's powerful, isn't it? It's so simple, too. It's just ba ba, Really easy, right? But it adds so much to the song. I really like that. And you feel like everybody is just kind of looking at each other, just getting ready for the next big thing that's about to happen. Now, in that last bit of chaos, I don't know if you heard it, but there was another synthesizer layer on top of that that wasn't in the previous pass. Uh, again, you know, the song is a lot of builds into a change, and uh, and it's really cool. It's just another little touch to add to it. Uh, lower notes on that synth, so it's a, a little easier to pick out in contrast to the bass. Um, definitely uh, on the Moog. Uh, and then we get into, okay, now we're, now we're hitting it. Now we're hitting that part. Great drum beat. It's almost like a drum riff, I want to say, from Lee Kerr's. Like, it's just got so much going on. feels very much more like the percussive version of a guitar riff than it does a drum beat. And uh, really, it, it's fun to play. I can say that, honestly. I played the song many times as a drummer, and I, I just love it. This part is just the best. So enjoy.
Well, I'm pretty sure I said it before, but good God, man. <laughs> what a killer long solo. I, you know, and what, one of the things that I really love about this is he's not trying to fill every little space with notes or with something different. He's got a lot of times where he's just hitting a chord and letting it go and just kind of letting it breathe and leaving a little room. I also love that we go back into that chaos part a couple of times behind the solo and mix like, I don't care. I'm doing my thing. I'm going to keep playing. You guys do what you want in the background, but this, this is going to happen. And he, you know, the music goes where it goes in the background. It plays along with him and then it contrasts and it plays along and contrasts. It's such a, a, a wonderful piece of music that allows it to go back and forth like that. And it's, it's very much representative of life in so many ways that, you know, some things seem like they're going so well and other things seem like they're falling apart. I mean, you could really wax philosophical on this and, and really go off, but I don't really want to do that. But I do want to point out that it does have a, a very interesting similarity to life that I don't think I ever realized until just now um, how true that is or that it even happened at all. <laughs> but this is really cool. It, it's such a great solo. There's so many great parts in it, but the, the fact that he plays, he backs off and lets it breathe. He plays and he backs off and lets it breathe. And and he doesn't stop when the parts change behind him to adjust at all. He just keeps going. It's really great. And the drumming from Lee, some of his best stuff, as far as I'm concerned. I'm a huge fan of Lee's work. Uh, you know, I, I've learned so much from him as a drummer. I've spent so much time listening to him. But this is really one of the songs where I think he just he just shines so bright and he's not even the focus he's the background you know because we're all focusing on the guitar solo we feel the drums but we're not really paying attention that much unless you're specifically trying to target listening to the drums you're probably really focusing on mick and where mick is taking us in the song so all this stuff that lee is doing it's just it's pandemonium but it's controlled pandemonium. It makes sense. It feels like it's out of control, but it's all very structured and so well played. Um, absolutely just crazy. And then the, the mix of the drums really helps. But, and this is where I think I, I would love just a little bit uh, you know, heavier of a kick along with that punchy sound because I think that that it would just you know press against the chest a little bit more to really drive the solo. But the solo itself, it, it drives great. It, it really does. But I think a little bit more in that percussion would have been nice. Um, but it certainly isn't lacking without it. Um, it's got a good punch to it, like I said earlier. But, you know, I just like to have a little more. Uh, apart from that, though, and everybody else was just, you know, keeping it going, um, really providing that foundation that allowed Mick to really just go in any direction he wanted to. So one of the most beautifully crafted things I think that he has done in their entire career in this song. And they've done a lot of great stuff. Don't get me wrong. I've talked about it in 307 song reviews, but this, this right here is just, it's for lack of a better term, it's magic. And here again, we've entered another part that could be yet another subsection of the song. Um, th this is really interesting, though, the effect that they have on his vocals. It sounds chorused, I want to say. But when, when I say chorus, I don't mean like the chorus of a song where there's like multiple people singing. It really sounds like it's all David Byron with a with a very thick chorus on it. And it's, you know, doubling the, the sound or tripling the sound of his voice. Uh, they might have been using something different back then. I'm not sure. I know that there was another delay effect that we heard, and we'll hear some other like reverb washes and stuff throughout this part that are really cool. But uh, just just for the main part of what he's singing, and I think it sounds great. But we're also changing perspective. I've always felt like he's he was singing as uh, an observer, as a narrator of what was going on before, and now he's kind of singing as the magician uh, who is being celebrated, and now he's kind of taking control as the song segued into a completely different section of this were a musical, the musical number would have changed into something completely different like we have here. So it really kind of feels more like that. Um, I've never read or anything uh, or seen anything that confirms that, but that's just always been the way that I felt about the song. Um, certainly would explain the change of voice, the, the fact that it's 
the the point of view, the perspective has changed um, and the effect and everything. So uh, it kind of makes sense. But that's what I've always felt about it. And it's it's kind of personal. Now he's singing in first person. So it, it does feel like there's been a, a, a perspective change here. Um, but I really like it. I, I really like the effects that they throw into this. I like the mood of it. Um, it kind of feels like, um, take a walk with me. I'm going to tell you a story. And the music really is kind of... Um, it's not a march, but it kind of feels like it's just stepping you along down the path to whatever the destination is going to be. And I really like that. So let's listen to some more. These little vocal effects that they're putting on there are adding so much. I mean, it it makes the the whole thing, th- this conversation that we're having, really surreal. You know, almost like we're entering into a world that we don't belong in in one way, but yet feel comfortable in in another. And I really like that. Um, you know, he's just basically coming in and saying, this is how it is. This is the power that I have. But all these little effects kind of feel like he's almost showing off a little bit like, look, I can throw my voice over here. Look, I can make it do this. I have this power and I'm kind of showing it off. I really dig this. This is a really cool part of the song. And, and it, it's a great segue into the final section. Okay, seriously, go back and listen to that section a couple times. Uh, most podcast players have like a 10 or 15 second rewind on them. Uh, use that a couple times. The first time, listen behind the vocals. You're going to hear uh, a Hammond organ that follows that vocal line perfectly, and it sounds amazing. Um, really just adds uh, some some thickness, but also an effect that makes it feel like a little bit ethereal because it's following the vocals perfectly. And it sounds like it's one sound. It's all one thing together and it's not. But I really like that. And then listen, go back and listen again to what Gary Thane is playing on bass behind this because it is just so fantastic. He could have easily just walked this part, but that's not something he would do. That's actually not something any bass player in Uriah Heap would have done. He's really going for it and adding just a, a beautiful, motion to this to uh, keep it moving forward and keep it interesting and it really again just adds so much flavor to this I love this pitch change. It it tells me that we're now going to a different perspective of storyteller. I'm not sure exactly who it is unless we're going to the narrator or maybe the person that the magician is having the conversation with. I've never really been clear on that. I've never really formed a, a final opinion on that, but that's kind of what I'm feeling in the moment. Um, also, it's really interesting too what Lee Kerslake is playing here because he's hitting a lot of crashes, but they have a short decay. So um, they're really not uh, ringing out a whole lot. And they're kind of sounding like he's just hitting the hi-hat a lot harder for uh, alternate hits, but they're changing pitch. So it's not the hi-hat um, unless he's playing a little bit more towards the bell. But I don't think that's the case. I think there are crashes that just have a very short decay. This is such a great final segment to the song. I I mean, it really, 
after everything that we've been through, the, the chaos, the craziness, the peacefulness, the celebration of the magician's birthday, all this stuff, and then we're taken into a dark world, it, it really just gives us a finality of warmth and embrace that everything's going to be okay. Uh, I love the vocal pitches here. I think they're amazing. Uh, and with that theremin synth behind them, following it um, would uh, in a lot of ways normally give this kind of a creepy feel, but it, it really almost feels more in celebration this time. Uh, you know, theremin's used in a lot of older horror movies. It's really kind of designed to be a wild instrument, but here it just, it just works so well. So here's another decision that's really out of place that works. We've got the kazoo, we've got the theremin, um, We've got all these weird vocal effects. There's so much going on in the song. It's just amazing. And I have to say, I love this part so much that there are times when I was listening to the to the album um, where I would like let this play out and let it fade off. And then I would just take the needle and put it right back around where this part started and just listen to it again and again a few times because it just it's such a great place to sit and, and listen to these beautiful sounds that I just it, it's over so fast when you know the the song's been so long and then this part just seems to go very quickly even though it's you know it's it's a good length of time um but it's just so enjoyable i just kind of want to sit and enjoy it more so i've played it a few times to really get my fill of it In all fairness, uh, you know, I wanted to do a fresh perspective on these songs, so I did not go back and listen to the original episodes where I covered these songs with a guest. So I don't remember if I noticed this or not. I think I might have just played it until the audio faded out, but there's actually a good 10, 11 seconds at the end of this song that's just blank on the deluxe CD version. So I find that interesting because normally they would cut it off. So there must have just been some error and the file ran a little longer before they stopped uh, the the dub and didn't really notice it. So uh, there's just like 10 seconds sitting there. So the if you're looking at the time and it's 1029, that's a little bit deceptive. I would say it's like 1018, 1019, where there's any real usable audio. And then after that, there's just nothing. Um, but beautiful song, absolutely beautiful song. It's, it's not surprising that this one's so popular and that they still play it to this day. The energy that they throw into it on stage is, is just as much energy as it was all these years ago. Absolutely stunning song from beginning to end. It's, it's not epic because it's of, of its length. It's epic because it's such a, a journey, an intense journey with so many things that happen. You know, we've got parties, we've got darkness, we've got explanations, we've got uh, recovery, we've got all this stuff that's in the song. That, to me, makes it an epic track. I mean, even if it was four and a half minutes and all those parts were condensed down, epic. Um, amazing solo, one of Mick's best, to, to be honest. There's a reason that people keep going back and talking about the solo in this song, partly because there's so much of it, you know, but, but there's not a second squandered. Not at all. I mean, every bit of it is is worth listening to. Um, I don't feel like uh, they could have they could have cut that down a few measures because he's he's just transitioning so well from one thing into another in the solo that I, I think we would have been cheated if it was any shorter. So that is my re-review of The Magician's Birthday, an excellent song from the album The Magician's Birthday. So we'll be back in the next episode with another review song. In the meantime, guys, stay warm, take care of each other, and have a great day. Cheers! Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, The Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. 
I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days.